Thank you, brother. Well, church, how are we doing? Good, man. Super glad to be with you guys. Um, man, the last time I, w- I was in this area, I was in uh, San Antonio in December. And boy, let me tell you what. This area, from, from December to now, you want to talk about... It's like somebody just left the heat on, like from <laughs> December until now. Because I was like, oh, oh, it's, th- it's this hot. This is, this is Texas heat. I, I get it. I get it. So um, I'm, I'm going to, I might sweat a little, uh, especially as I get preaching. And, and I started to realize if I preach too hard on this stage, I'm going to fall to my death. Uh, so, so I'm going to try my best to, to, not, to not preach too hard. Um, but, but y'all, again, I'm, I'm so thankful to be here with you guys. Um, again, my name is Dana Ritchie. I'm, I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, hey, man, all right, we got some got some Tar Heels, man, y'all are, I, y'all are my kind of people, why'd y'all escape to the heat, that <laughs> doesn't does make a whole lot of sense, but y'all are brave, so, so power to you, but y'all, tonight what I want to do is, um, is I, I do want to open up God's Word um, and, uh, and see what the Apostle Paul has to say for us um, from Romans chapter 12, but uh, and another thing I do recognize is that um, God, God in His grace has given me uh, just a very unique story in, in a lot of ways. And I found out if, if I don't get the armless elephant out of the middle of the room, <laughs> y'all are, y'all are going to sit there in those chairs all night and go, how does this poor boy brush his teeth? Or, you know, uh, some, some of y'all are going to sit there and go, but wait, how do he lose his arms? And people, people wonder all the time, like out in North Carolina, you know, we've got the Atlantic Ocean and people immediately think it, it was a shark. Or I, 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 had a guy, I had a guy ask me one time, was it two sharks at once? <laughs> I'm like, buddy, if it was two sharks at once, there'd be a movie about, about that, man. For, forget Sharknado. That, that one's... That one's a whole nother ball, ball game. And then I, I did have another guy, you know, if you've ever, um, has anybody in, in this room flown Southwest? Um, like when you fly on a plane, y'all it's like herding cattle. You know, when they're getting you on the plane, you're all snugged up against each other and we're shuffling forward. And there's a guy right beside me, points at my empty sleeve and goes, was it a bear? <laughs> <laughs> and y'all like... I'm, I'm a grumpy, I'm a grumpy traveler in, in a lot of ways. And so at this point I was, I was tired and I was a little snippy and, and I looked at him and I went, is this like us getting the bucket from KFC? And you know how you just go for the legs? Was this bear, this bear was an arm bear. Is that, is that what you're telling me? And he went, oh yeah, it's probably not right, is it? I'm like, no. Nobody, it's not. Um, so to, to dismiss, I think, a, a lot of the questions that, that may, maybe you might have rolling around in your, in your mind tonight, um, just the, the quick of my story is this. I was, I was just born this way for no, uh, literally no medical reason whatsoever. Um, my, mom, my mom had a healthy pregnancy, and my mom had two ultrasounds. And so all along the way, the expectation for my parents was to have this healthy baby boy. And so nobody knew that it, not a single thing was wrong until literally I come into this world and the doctor's holding me in the delivery room and this hush just sweeps over the whole delivery room because everybody's realizing this is not how this should be. And, and to top everything else off, not only am I armless, but I'm, I'm lifeless. I'm not breathing. I'm not moving. The doctor tries to find a pulse, and and he can't find a pulse. And so very quickly, he turns, and he holds me up to my dad so dad can see that I don't have arms. And the doctor just asks him, do you want us to let him go? And I think, and I mean, y'all, we we know in the day and age we live in, I mean, especially in view of, you know, what what the pregnancy center is doing in, in Seguin. Like, we live in a day and age where kids are disposable. And where kids, like in, in all honesty, when kids like me, the governor of Virginia back in February describes the exact conversation that my parents have. 
is that a kid with a disability, a lot like mine, will be brought into the world, will be kept comfortable, and then the discussion ensues between the doctor and the mother. That's the world we live in. And that's, in, in, in that second, that's, that's the world, and that's, that's the, just this complete counterintuitive way of seeing life. Life, that's what my parents are having to butt up against. And I'm so thankful that I had two parents that were like, no, that's, that's our boy, and, and you do whatever it is you can do to try to bring him back. And I mean, I, th I think a lot of us in that moment, like we want to say, yeah, I, I, I'll have that boldness. But I mean, even in, that, even in that moment, like my dad tells me after the fact, at, at the end of the day, I was just, I was scared. I didn't know what to do. You know, and, and, and as the doctors rushed me out, he just went over to my mom. And I, I think a lot of us, like spiritual leaders of the family, we want to say, oh man, we're going to have all the wise things to say and we're going to be faithful and amazing. And my dad was like, the only thing I could do is hold your mother's hand and cry. And we just really quickly prayed. And it was a simple prayer that, God, if you let our little boy live, we'll give him to you. Whatever that means, Lord, we're all in. And man, by God's grace, just a couple minutes later, doctor walks in with a little kicking, screaming, armless baby boy. And finally, you know, in this whole process, my mother never got to see me or touch me or hold me. And so finally she gets to hold her baby boy. But then what starts to happen is we're, we're in a teaching hospital where I'm from in North Carolina. And so word starts to spread. Hey, there's this, there's this armless baby boy up on the third floor, you should, you should come check him out. And so all of these, all of these doctors are coming. It's, it's uh, surgeons, orthopedic specialists, pediatricians. A hand specialist comes in my room and my dad's like, he, he doesn't have any of those. <laughs> the doctor's like, you're right, I'm sorry. Uh, carry on, you know. And, uh, and, and every single one of these doctors would check me out and, you know, take vitals and measurements. And each of them would give a prognosis, and every single doctor but one gave a negative prognosis to the outcome of my life. And it ran the range from my parents were told I'd never write, I'd never feed myself, I'd never go to normal school, I'd never graduate, I'd never get a job, I'd never be fully independent. One doctor told my parents, you should give this kid up for adoption because you don't know what you're in for. Like, that's, that's the first three hours of my life. And, and in all honesty, like, that, that first three hours really cast a shadow that I lived underneath for a good chunk of my life. Because in all honesty, like, my, my physical body has never been a struggle. Because truthfully, from that moment, my parents were like, well, you know, this is the kid God gave us. This is the kid that obviously... God has saved and, and truly brought back to life. So God's got this. And so that's, that's how they raised me. They, you know, I, I always tell people, God had a sense of humor because he gave my parents me. And then he gave my parents my six foot five, 230 pound special forces brother <laughs> that, that blows people up for a living. And so I'm like, so somewhere in the way you parent, you... You, uh, you create armless pastors and people who kill people. Like, <laughs> all right. So, and, and the, y'all, they, they raised me the exact same way. They raised my brother. Um, and, and I think in a lot of ways, they were more tough on me because they realized if, if they coddled me, I would, just ex I would expect that for the rest of my life. Everybody else is going to do everything for me. And so early on, you know, I had the, I had the list of, of naughty words that every other four-year-old has in the house, but I had one phrase tacked on. I got, I got whooped if I said the phrase, I can't. And, and I remember so many times, like, y'all, feet are... God did not make feet for fine motor skills. <laughs> like, and, and I remember, I distinctly remember being a five-year-old kid and trying to, just simple things, squeeze toothpaste... Onto a toothbrush. Super simple. But it was either like you get the thin blue glaze like on the top of the brush or you get like Mount Aquafresh 
on, on the top of the toothbrush. There really, there really wasn't anything else in between. And I remember sitting in the floor in the bathroom one time, and it was just squirt after squirt of not, not brushing my teeth. And I, and I remember yelling downstairs to my mom, Mama, I can't do that. And as soon as the words came out of my mouth, I tensed up. Because you, it's, it's like, boy, there's times when you can just like taste it, you know, you, you know it's coming. And so she came upstairs and she dealt with me and she's like, all right, try to do it again. And that was, that was how my parents raised me. But man, by God's grace, like all of those things that the doctor said that I would never do, God was like, really? Watch, watch. And I was able to, you know, feed myself, sticking a, sticking a spoon in between my toes and and eaten. Um, you know, I was able to write with my feet. I was able to type in keyboard class with my toes. You know, I, I went to a normal elementary school, didn't, didn't go to any sort of special ed class. I did all the other assignments that the kids did. They did it with their hands. I did it with my toes, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm a good old North Carolina boy, like a lot of good old Texas boys in this room. And so I grew up shooting stuff and hunting stuff and you know I'll I'll never I'll never forget like me and my best friend his uh, his dad was a farmer and uh, and we went his barn one afternoon we're probably 13 14 and we go into the back of the barn and the back of the barn is the biggest stash of fireworks I've ever seen in my life and now y'all know how this goes <laughs> like like shooting off dinky bottle rockets ain't good enough for a redneck and so so what we did is we took every single one of those fireworks and we broke them open and we pulled together all the powder and we found we we found a metal coffee can in the barn and we poured it we poured it all in the coffee can and, and we found like some uh, some little piece of twine or something that we used as the, as the fuse and we duct taped the top shut and then we stuck it under a stump and blew it up. And now, now looking, looking back in my 30, 35 years of life, when you're down two limbs, the, la the, last, the last thing in the world that an armless man needs to be doing is playing with homemade fireworks, you know? Like, because then that's when my testimony takes a dark turn at age 13 and when I became the no-armed one-leg pastor, you know? Like... God, God in His grace, He He saved me even even from my from my redneck good times and uh, and, and man, um, just by His grace, I was I was able to survive my teens and um, you know got a license just like everybody else my my age got a license and um, you know went to went to college on a full ride met met the girl of my dreams in college and we got married we have two kids now we have a seven year old boy and a four year old little girl. And um, amen. And, and, and now, by God's grace, I'm, I'm in year 19 of ministry. And, and all of that for a kid that literally minute one, the world didn't think was good enough to live. And that, that truthfully, that right there was my struggle. Is, is looking around in this world and realizing I'm the one armless kid in a world full of arms. And I remember growing up, even with God-fearing parents, going, God, if you loved me, I wouldn't have to deal with this. God, if you loved me, you would have made me like every other person in my middle school. Like, God, why am I the only person that has to eat pizza with my toes? Or, God, why am I the only person when I walk into the grocery store that everybody's stopping and staring and pointing and snickering? God, what I do to deserve this? And I spent a long time underneath that shadow of not being good enough and of feeling like damaged goods and feeling out of place. And I spent years and years and years as a, as a church kid and hearing the gospel. But I'll never forget being a 15-year-old kid. And God's, God's providence is a funny thing. Because I had a buddy invite me to a dodgeball lock-in. Now, I tell you what. I can, I can do a lot of things. Dodgeball is not one of them. Like... If you can imagine putting a pinata on a dodgeball court, 
that's what I was. And, and so the whole night, I just got beat to death. Like, they, they knew I couldn't catch. They knew I couldn't throw. And, uh, and after about four hours of the massacre, the youth pastor was like, all right, time out. Let's have a devotion. And so he sits down, and he starts talking out of Romans chapter 5. And he starts talking about the fact that God loves us so much that even when we hated him, Jesus goes to the cross. When we were completely helpless to remedy our situation, Jesus comes to this earth to live the life we could never live, completely sinless and without fault. He dies the death that each and every one of us most definitely should die because we're all sinners and rebels. And he dies and rises again from the dead so that I can have not only victory over death, but victory over sin to have my identity and my righteousness and my everything wrapped up in the person and the work of Jesus Christ that all who trust in him might have eternal life, but might have life and life more abundant right now. That is his love wrapped up in a nutshell. And I started sitting there realizing this whole time I've been setting my scorecard completely wrong. I've been looking at God's love on my terms and that's the most faithless thing I could ever do. What Jesus does is he steps into our mess and he remedies it and he gives us hope, he gives us a family, he gives us salvation, and truthfully, he gives us purpose. And really, like, as, as, as I started to grow in my faith, what you start to see in, in the book of Romans is you see this book built on the grace and the glory and the gospel of God. That it starts off in Romans chapter 1 almost with bad news that man has chosen his own way. He's gone off and he's done his own thing and he has hardened his heart. And the picture goes on in Romans 3 that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. We all deserve death. And we see in Romans 5 that the first Adam comes on the scene and messes it all up. But honestly, in, in, in that same little section, we also see the, the glimpse of the second Adam. That Christ had come and just as much as the sin of one man broke all of creation. So the life of one man was going to redeem it. Yeah. And we even see Paul's internal struggle in Romans chapter 7 when even he, as a believer, he keeps finding himself being drug off by sin. He says, I, I, don't, I know what I should do, but I keep doing the thi all of the things that I know I shouldn't. Who will save me from this body of death? And it's like the whole tenor of the entire book of Romans changes in the very next chapter. In Romans chapter 8 verse 1 when it says, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And the book of Romans just begins to lay out this beautiful picture of our adoption, of his pursuit of us, of the fact that there is nothing that separates us from the love of God. And that as we walk in that love, the rest of Romans is built on the so what. We see in Romans 10 how beautiful are the feet of those who carry the good news. And as we see right here tonight, what I really want us to lock in on, if you have your Bibles, we're going to read the very last verse of Romans chapter 11, verse 36, and then we're going to read the first two verses of Romans chapter 12. So if you have your copy of God's word, read along with me. In verse 36 it says this, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect. 
May God bless the reading of his word. Let's, let's pray real quick. Father, I just pray in these next few moments as we look at your gospel and your grace that, Father, we would be faithful to go and walk in it with joy, that we would go and live in view of the mercy, in view of the purpose that you have sat on us as those that you have made in your image. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You, you may be seated. Now, I think one of the things that is just so important for us to see here, and, and, and even in verse 36, that's, that's my wife's favorite verse. That's my wife's life verse. But in that is sown in this beautiful picture that each and every one of us in here are made with purpose from purpose. And you get the glimpse of that all the way back in Genesis chapter 1 when we get this glimpse in the midst of creation, we see God making all things, making the fish of the sea, making the birds of the air, making the mountains. And then we get this glimpse in Genesis 1.27 of this Trinitarian conversation. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and they say, let us make man in our image. And truthfully, from chapter 1 of Scripture all the way up until now, we see this beautiful picture that each and every one of us are formed in fashion to display the glory of God in all the earth. And in that, God has created us with purpose and without mistake. Because there's a lot of us in here tonight, we feel like a mistake. We feel like we've missed it. We feel like our, our lives are defined by our mistakes and our sins far more than what God in His grace has truly done. And we have just allowed that to haunt us. Or maybe even as good gospel people, the thing that we start to do is we live in a day and age that's so comparison-based. We live in a day and age where we click on Instagram and we see everybody's perfect life and their perfect kids and their perfect house and their perfect dog and their perfect lawn and you're like man I can't even I can't even boil water without burning the house down like my my life doesn't doesn't feel very perfect right now and, and we can come into church and we can feel like this is the the harbor for perfect people and and, and we start to feel alone and we, and we start, start to feel isolated and we start to look across these pews and go, well, I don't have their, their house or their family or their gifts or their leadership in this church, so I must not matter in the kingdom of God. But y'all, that is a direct lie from the enemy because the, the, the very thing that he wants you to believe is that God doesn't love you and God has no purpose for you. When all along the way, the gospel cries something completely different. That God does love you, God is pursuing you, and God is calling you to trust in and rest in him so that you can live out your very purpose. If you're sitting in here tonight going, I don't even know what my purpose is, it, it is very simple. It is to display the glory of God in all the earth in whatever you do. Whether you're a retiree, a mechanic, a farmer, a Walmart worker, a mom, a dad, a lawyer, whatever you do, God has called us to use the lives that he has graciously given us and to carry it out in all the world. He didn't mess up. When he made you. God does not make poor image bearers. He didn't crack your mirror in terms of you reflecting the glory of God in all the earth. He designed you as you are with purpose. He gave you the people in your life to carry the gospel to. Those are people that I will never meet. Those are people that you have relational influence that your pastor will never have relational influence. But God in His grace has given you these gifts and these people to display it in all the world. And that truthfully, like y'all, our very lives in recognition of the grace. Like when you look in verse 1 right there, Paul's appeal to us is he says, I appeal to you by the mercies of God. Like his call to the church is in view of all of the grace that you have. Go and live it out. Realize that God has given you this life, 
this body, which is your spiritual form of worship, to offer up. Like God has given you this opportunity in this day, in this hour, to go and reflect Him. And it comes with all that you are. And, and there will be plenty of times in our lives when we wonder what in the world is God doing. When we sit in the midst of darkness or when we sit in the midst of suffering and go, God, I don't, I don't, I don't see the point in this. I don't, I don't see how the gospel can redeem this. Just as much as I probably spent the first 20 years of my life going, God, why? Of all of the things in the world, why did you have to make me without arms? God, you could have, you could have given me a birthmark on, on, on my neck and I could just hide it with a collared shirt. Or I could, have, I could have stuttered and all I have to do is keep my mouth shut. God, you could have made me six foot eleven and given me a silky smooth jump shot. And I could be an NBA player to the glory of God. But I, could, I got two empty sleeves. And all of the baggage. And all of the stairs. Like, there, y'all, there is literally, there is not a private moment in my life. Anywhere I go in public, people stare. And I always used to wonder, God, why? And what I realize is, is truthfully, in His grace, the way is designed me. Again, God doesn't make mistakes. He designed me to reflect His glory in all the earth. And, and I, y'all, I have more gospel conversations with people outside the church than I do inside the church. Because again, in the world's perspective, I'm the disposable kid. In, in the outside world's perspective, I should be miserable, I should be a hermit, I should hate life and everyone. But God, in His grace and in His mercy, rescues and redeems me and He gives me joy and hope. And suddenly people are looking at this kid that should be forlorn and they go, well, why is he not miserable? And, and y'all like... I have more gospel conversations with people in the gas station than anywhere on the planet. Because, I mean, it's like, let's just, let's just draw this picture for a second. Like, you're at Bucky's, you're, you're filling up your truck, and all of a sudden, this little silver Honda Accord pulls up behind you, and an armless guy gets out. And now you're going to think, that's not legal. Like, <laughs> there's, this, this, this is a hidden camera show, <laughs> you know? And, and it's like, I, as soon as I get out of the car, I can feel people's eyes. Like, you know, they're not staring yet. They're kind of side-eyeing me. They're, they're acting like they're filling up their truck, but the gas pump stopped like two minutes ago. <laughs> and they're just kind of staring. They're trying to feel out the whole situation. So what I do is, like, I can't, I can't keep a debit card in my pockets because, you know, I don't have hands. And so... Uh, <laughs> I have to keep my debit card in my shoe. And so I'll pull out my debit card and I'll swipe in the debit card reader and I'll punch in the PIN number. And now at this point, every single person in the gas station is staring. Like they don't, they don't care that I know. They're just, they got their popcorn and they're watching. <laughs> and so I'll take the gas, gas pump out and I'll stick it in the side of my car. And now like y'all again, God gave me talent in toes. He did, he did not give me very long toes. And so I can't, I can't depress the handle on the gas pump and put that kickstand thing down so the gas will start pumping. And so what I have to do for, for like four seconds is I have to lay down on my back in the middle of the gas station. I stick both feet up in the air so I can use both of those feet almost like a little alligator mouth. And I'll pinch down the handle and put the kickstand thing down. Now, I don't know what goes through people's minds, but I'm fairly certain they think that whatever bear has ripped my arms off that I have now that I have now bled out in the middle of the gas station. And, and without fail, people will pop around my car or they will pop around the gas pump and they're like, are you okay? <laughs> and I'm sitting there like, I mean, it's 96 degrees, Texas heat, like, I'm all right, but how are you? And suddenly they realize I'm not dying and, and they're stuck in a conversation with an armless man that they, they don't want to be in. And so... Almost without fail, the very next question is, so what happened? Because they, they want the bear story or the shark story or what, whatever. And, it, and in that like 60 second, two minute window that I have with them, 
I'm not going to tell them about how I eat a cheeseburger with my toes or how I drove that Honda into the gas station. I'm going to take those 60 seconds or those two minutes and talk about how God in his grace rescued a kid that has no excuse and no reason to even be here. But by his grace and by his mercy, he has stitched me back together. And do you know that same Jesus? Do you know that same gospel? And y'all, I get to share the gospel with people because they ask me. I don't have to go hunting them down. Because they see in earthly terms a person that should be utterly miserable, but because of the fruit and the work of God in my life, people can't even remotely begin to understand, and so they have to figure it out. All of that by God's design and by God's grace. And so for us in this room, Paul gives the simple challenge is don't be conformed to this age. Don't keep score the way the world keeps score, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Realizing that, you know what? You may never have that six-figure job. Or you may never have that brand new GMC Sierra HD. Or you might not have the really nice boat and the really nice house on the lake. You might not have all all of the public authority and renown that your neighbor does. But God has called you to something so much bigger than storing up treasures that moths eat and that rust takes care of. But God in His grace has especially equipped you to impact the world right where you are. And sure, you may never get up on a stage and preach or sing. You may never lead a small group. But you can live your life in view of the mercies that God has laid in your very life. And it all starts with going all in and knowing that He's the only one worth building your life on. I love the way the Gospel of John ends because it's almost the way the Gospel of John should begin is John pens the words that each and every one of these words are written in this gospel so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and you may have life in his name. And y'all, that's it right there. Our life only makes sense through him and in him. And there's some of us tonight that for some reason or another, we have run from him We have defined His grace and His character on our terms. And we've said, you know what, God, this is why I'm not trusting you with my everything. When all along the way, He has shown us so much love and grace and hope in the gospel of His Son. That He has pursued you He has laid it all out and it is simply to all who trust and repent, you'll be saved. To all who make Him the master and the owner and the possessor of their life, to those He gives the right to become the children of God. And some of y'all tonight, you have lived however many years just thinking maybe Jesus is a good guy. Jesus was a talented teacher. But y'all, Jesus is Lord or Jesus is not. And there's a lot of us here in the South, we want Jesus as Savior, but we don't want Him as Lord. And that's not how the gospel works. Either you take Him as Lord or you don't take Him at all. And some of you tonight, just here in a simple moment, my challenge to you is, is he, is he Lord? And if he isn't, I would challenge you just here in a second, come forward. Come grab your pastor. Come grab one of, one of these deacons in this room. And just see what it is to trust Jesus as your everything. But I think just as much, there's a whole lot of us who have tasted grace and we're not doing anything with it. 
the most selfish thing that we can do is to make our relationship with Christ a strictly personal relationship. Because if you taste the grace of God and huddle it to yourself and don't share it with the world, that is the most selfish thing you can do because you have the greatest news on the planet and you're not willing to get uncomfortable to share it. And that is selfish and ultimately you are damning the people in your life because you are not willing to give them the hope that they desperately need. And some of us tonight need to wipe the excuses off the table and realize the God that made me and the God that saved me is also the God that can send me. And all I got to do is go. He'll take care of the rest. And for a lot of us, that is the challenge we need to walk in tonight. It is the challenge to be people who walk in the very purpose why God made us for and it is to reflect His glory and His grace in all the world. Let's pray. Father, I thank You so much for every man and every woman that is in this room. God, I just pray that they do see Your grace and Your love and Your pursuit and Your mercy in their lives. And Father, in light of that, I pray they see you as their everything. And I pray they go and live like you're their everything. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.